I think I will start. Um, <clears throat> my name is Professor Chris Alden. I'm the director, along with Christopher Coker, of the LS of LSE Ideas, which is a foreign policy think tank here at, at uh, the London School of Economics and Political Science, or LSE. This is a, a, an event uh, entitled China's Media Influence in Africa, and it's hosted by two of the projects associated to and with LSE Ideas, the Digital IR Project and China Foresight. These two flagship projects uh, have been involved in, in aspects of this area for, for some time. So I urge you to check the website out and you can find out a bit more about them. So as I said, today, we're very uh, privileged to have a, a number of speakers, a, a good number of speakers, and, and all of them experts on aspects of, of what is China's media influence in Africa. Um, the, to, to what we're hoping to look at today uh, is um, the acceleration of the campaign to influence me media outlets, news consumers around the world, to tell, this, to tell China's story and tell it well, to paraphrase Xi Jinping. Um, Africa occupies in this setting an important position uh, in, in uh, Beijing's quest to influence uh, narrative on China's rise, reflecting the importance that China attaches to the relationship with countries in the global south uh, generally, and in particular, uh, Africa. So how and why China is influencing Africa's media landscape is one of, this, uh, one of the key drivers for this agenda, and, and indeed the research that all the collected authorities here have devoted some amount of time towards. Um, uh, so we are, we are going to uh, uh, build on, on some of the, the latest publications uh, about media influence. Freedom House, amongst others, has talked about uh, uh, the, the CCP's, the Chinese Communist Party's uh, tactics in the media environments, cyber uh, operations, and that sort of thing. In any case, we're going to talk about this topic with the help of, of four speakers, distinguished speakers, the, uh, and I'll speak to them. Uh, I will introduce them collectively now in the order that they will be presenting. Uh, our first speaker uh, is uh, An Anjali Dart, Dat, sorry, Anjali Dat, a senior research analyst for China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan at Freedom House. She leads on the Media Bulletin as a monthly bilingual digest providing news and analysis on media freedom related to China and co-authored special Beijing global media influence uh, reports. Before that, she worked uh, at the China Human Rights Defenders um, organization, writing under the pen name of Francis Eve and holds a master's degree from Peking University, LSE, uh, and as well as uh, modern uh, an honors in modern history from University of St. Andrews. After um, Anjali, we'll have Emeka Umeji, uh, uh, who's the Reagan Fassel uh, Democracy Fellow um, at the International Forum for Democratic Studies at National Endowment for Democracy. Dr. Umeji is a media scholar whose research focuses on China media, Chinese digital infrastructures, in particular in Africa. Uh, he's taught at a number of institutions, including my old uh, uh, stomping ground of the University of Bitbatisran um, in South Africa, um, American University in Nigeria, the University of Ghana, um, and has held a number of positions, research positions in uh, Germany, as well as publishing a book on China media and Africa perceptions, performance, and paradox. Um, Quibus van Staden will speak, speak next. He's a senior researcher of the Foreign Policy Program, South African Institute of International Affairs, and, China, and with the China Global South Project, uh, a, a, um, a, a web service and media service that, that uh, broadcasts around the world around questions initially of China, Africa, and more broadly around uh, China and the Global South in recent years. He completed his PhD in Japanese studies and media studies at University of Nagoya in 2008 um, and has been working on, as I said, all sorts of aspects of this particular area. Um, uh, was chair, Sarchi, part of the Sarchi Chair on African Diplomacy and Foreign Policy at the University of Johannesburg. Um, and, and finally, my our last speaker is, is um, 
Bing Chun Meng, who's a professor of department here at the LSE in the Department for Media and Communications, co-directs the LSE Fudan Global Public Policy Research Center, uh, and is a good director of the LSE PhD Academy um, uh, and the partnerships related to the SRC. She, she has worked before as a postdoc fellow at the Edinburgh School of Communication, University of Pennsylvania, um, and has taught uh, courses on Chinese media. Thank you very much to all our speakers, and thank you for, I'm, I know I'm abbreviating your backgrounds, but the, the details are, uh, the fuller details are available on the website. So, so if I could start with our first speaker, Angeli, if you could uh, open up and we'll move in, uh, in that order from there. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chris, and thanks everyone um, for being here today. I'm going to share a presentation. Um, okay, it says I cannot share the presentation, so um, maybe Julia can put it up and I'll just uh, start speaking. So I'm going to be talking today about a report that Freedom House released in September of last year called Beijing's Global Media Influence. It was a comprehensive assessment examining the influence efforts of the CCP in 30 countries around the world and kind of crucially the democratic response in those countries. Um, so today I'm just gonna try and speak briefly about our methodology, some of the kind of key global findings as well as some of the Africa specific findings. Um, so to the next slide. So our, um, our coverage period for this project was 2019 to 2021. Um, that's, you know, in terms of the score, but if you look at some of the narrative reports, uh, you know, we do touch on some things that happened in 2022. Um, we really crucially wanted to look at the democratic response to authoritarian influence campaigns. So we selected 30 countries across six regions that were designated as either free or partially free in Freedom House's annual Freedom in the World report. The project included in-depth case studies based on research by local analysts in each country. So uh, my friend Omeka here is one of the analysts that we worked with. Um, and then also in consultation with external experts, we created a new methodology framework for this project. Um, as a part of that, we created numerical scores for each of the 30 countries, appraising the scale and scope of CCP media influence efforts in that country as well as a separate score assessing the strength of the local response and underlying media resilience. Um, so a little bit later, I'm gonna show the scores and statuses that we assigned for the countries that we um, studied in Africa. Um, the framework can be found on our website if other researchers wanna fill it out for countries that we didn't study. So kind of what did we find? Um, our kind of big global key findings is that the CCP is accelerating its multi-billion dollar campaign to shape global public opinion. And this is really um, in many ways to offset damage to its reputation caused by its own, own actions in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, the South China Sea, and the initial handling of the pandemic. Um, when we looked at narrative it, during this coverage period, um, there was a lot of um, um, kind of statements around those issues. Um, a second major finding was that the media influence efforts are becoming more sophisticated, covert, and coercive, um, in particular um, in countries where there was um, a longer time period of influence efforts, um, tactics started to become more coercive. But crucially, they found that there was resilience um, around the world. Local journalists, civil society activists, governments, and news consumers are really pushing back on these efforts. And we also found that underlying media regulations um, that protect freedom of expression and freedom of information are also helping to fend off negative impacts. Um, but we did find that resilience is uneven. We found vulnerabilities in every country under study, even those with very strong responses. Um, next slide. So this slide shows um, the kind of five major tactics that we looked at um, that sort of encompass our definition of media influence. Um, I'm just gonna go on this briefly because I don't wanna speak the whole time. Um, but the kind of five areas we looked at was um, kind of content dissemination. So that would be prevalence of um, state media content sharing agreements or paid inserts disinformation campaigns, which was deliberate spreading of falsehoods and um, through artificial means, um, censorship and intimidation, including blocking of websites or cyber attacks, 
control over content distribution infrastructure. Um, so that would be China-based companies controlling large uh, portions of mobile phone networks or digital television infrastructure. This is more prevalent in Africa. And then the final one was um, exporting the CCC model through training for media workers um, and officials. So next slide. Um, so these are kind of our um, overall findings of the 30 countries. We found that 18 of the 30 countries faced increased influence efforts over the course of our coverage period. And that in 16 out of the 30 countries, we found uh, high or very high intensive influence efforts. Um, the most, the countries that faced the most intense influence efforts um, under our study was Taiwan, the US and the UK, but Nigeria was the fourth highest and Kenya was the seventh highest. So it shows that you know, it's not just targeting um, kind of actors that you would expect. Um, but countries on the low end um, uh, with lower scores include Ghana and Senegal, but we still found kind of core dimensions of some of those five tactics that we mentioned that I mentioned earlier. So, um, so these, this slide, and I apologize if it's kind of small, um, these show the countries that we covered in Sub-Saharan Africa and the score that we gave for influence, which is on the top, and the score for resilience, as well as um, the overall status. Um, the trend is whether influence increased or decreased in then public opinion. So we found that all countries had increased influence efforts except for in South Africa. And that was because South Africa faced more intensive efforts prior to our coverage period. Um, of the six countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that we looked at, South Africa was the only country that was rated as resilient in our um, overall status. And this is really due to underlying academic and civil society institutions and pluralistic media outlets. Um, it, also, South Africa has um, pretty strong and well-defined legal, legal infrastructure on the press, including limits on foreign and cross-ownership in the media. We found that, um, as I mentioned before, Nigeria received the fourth highest level of influence efforts and was considered the most vulnerable of all 30 countries in our study. This is due in part to high scores we found in the censorship and intimidation uh, section, as well as in the exporting CCP model section. Um, we also, the reason why we find that Kenya had such high levels of influence is really due to the, um, the Chinese state media efforts to make Nairobi a hub for um, uh, state media in East Africa, and so a lot of points in the propaganda section. Um, in our entire global study of 30 countries, Senegal had the weakest resilience and response, um, and Ghana and Mozambique also ranked relatively lowly. But this was due in part um, more in also due in part to lower influence efforts to respond to. Um, in all of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that we looked at, local political elites had close or favorable ties to the CCP um, and had increased restrictions on press freedom, which created vulnerabilities to CCP influence. Um, and finally, some of the narratives that we found um, in Africa. Um, a lot of them were uh, positive, focusing on development opportunities through the Belt and Road Initiative, um, investment from Chinese companies, in particular during this coverage period, um, the COVID-19 aid and um, Chinese and African Brotherhood in fighting the pandemic. Um, we also found a lot of narratives that promoted that China is in a colonial power and contrasting China's actions in the continent compared to Western countries. Um, but one incident kind of also stuck out, which was how state media and diplomats tried to scramble to respond to local anger over discrimination against in China against Africans in 2020 in Guangzhou during the pandemic. So um, next slide. So a kind of major part of our study that I want to highlight is that we weren't just looking at influence efforts, but also kind of response and resilience, because influence is an one way street. Um, you can see from this map that there's a global scale of pushback, um, which we found, you know, in every region that we studied with democracies blunting the impact of these um, intensified efforts. Um, we, uh, in every country, in all 30 countries under study, we found at least one form of active pushback that reduced the effects of Beijing's activities, 
and really media and civil society were at the forefront of that um, democratic resilience. Um, so some of the specific examples of pushback that we found in Africa include uh, civil society groups from South Africa and Tunisia collaborated to hold a workshop for Tunisian journalists on how to report about Chinese investment projects. Kenya's Independent Pub Press Council rebuked the public broadcaster for publishing unlabeled Chinese state propaganda. In Kenya and Senegal, we found editors limited the scope of CCP propaganda in local media by selectively using articles and content sharing agreements with Xinhua. And Nigerian journalists used freedom of information requests to reveal government loans from Chinese state-owned banks. Um, so really, you know, kind of after this research, one of our big questions is what was the impact? Um, and to this, it's, um, it's still mixed. Some of Beijing's initiatives have run into stumbling blocks, but others have been effective or have laid groundwork for future advances. But in terms of one of the major aims of these campaigns to influence global public opinion and um, to tell China's story well, the CCP is seemingly failing. In 23 out of the 30 countries that we looked at, public opinion towards China or the Chinese government has declined since 2018. Um, Public opinion isn't the full story, and I don't, it's not the only way to measure impact. It was just you know, one, um, one uh, indicator we could look at. Um, we had, did find that other dimensions of media influence campaign had succeeded. The CCP dominates Chinese language media, including via WeChat. Um, media influence builds off other forms of political influence, um, and co-optation of elites can help amplify propaganda. And we did find in 16 out of the countries that we looked at that journalists reported self-censoring about China. So um, the next slide is sort of a final slide. Um, I won't go through it, but I'll kind of stop here. Um, the report does include detailed recommendations that we think can help enhance transparency, ensure diversity of coverage, and shore up vulnerabilities, um, which I'll be happy to talk about later. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. A uh, very comprehensive uh, overview of the of the um, report and and findings. Can I turn to Ameka for his uh, presentation? Um, thank you so much, Professor Ardin, um, for having me here. Um, the last time we met was at the University of Ghana in 2015. That was a long time ago. <laughs> okay. Um, um, well, uh, as, as of in 2012, um, uh, the Chinese government started um, some form of um, expansionist ag agenda in the media in Africa um, with state-led uh, Chinese media organizations. That was when we saw um, the movement of uh, the Xinhua. Um, Headquarters back to Africa. We saw we saw um, CCTV now CGTN Africa launched in Kenya, and so many other Chinese media organizations uh, started um, moving to expanding into Africa. Um, and at the time, there was um, a lot of excitement that um, I mean, the Chinese are coming, the Chinese media organizations are coming into Africa. I mean, maybe to change the narrative or maybe to um, win African audiences. But now, one decade after this uh, uh, expansionist uh, agenda, um, there have been limited influence uh, uh, on African audiences. You know, um, Chinese media organizations, Chinese media organizations, are yet to gain I mean, that anticipated tra traction with Af African audiences. Now, wh what has happened is that um, with the Belt and Road Initiative, um, it, the, the, Ch the Chinese government thought it right, or maybe they thought it well to think that um, there's need for um, a new approach to media engagement in the African media ecosystem. Um, so what you have is no more, um, you know, the Chinese state-led media uh, organizations in Africa, no. Now you have a, a form of multifaceted media engagement in the African media ecosystem here. Yeah. So you have, you know, the Chinese Communist Party um, influencing narrative, China messaging in Africa through, through various um, organs, organs that involve both state, Chinese state organs and uh, local organs or private media organizations in Africa. I will give you an example. Um, some of these approaches, one, you have the, you have Chinese media exchanges for African journalists. So um, 
Um, African journalists are, are, are sent to China to undergo training. This training has like three categories. You have the short term, you have the you have the professional track, which is like 10 months, and you have those who come to study for masters and PhD. And through this, African media journalists are inculcated into the Chinese way of uh, practicing journalism. Um, we we uh, we have done like you know two phases of work in, in this part of uh, um, the, on, on this um, this training. Um, the last part of work that I did uh, cut across all of Africa, where we interviewed journalists who have been in China for uh, a good number of months. And uh, one of the things that come through is that these journalists return back to uh, to their countries in Africa. One, you know, they become some form of indebted to to the Chinese government because I mean someone who, who went to China, well-paid, and when they return to Africa, they're happy and they say, oh, I mean, without going to China, I wouldn't have been able to achieve certain things. And so they are somehow indebted. Number two, they come back, they return to Africa with a different idea of what journalism should be. Um, most people in Africa, uh, most journalists in Africa uh, at the time of training are trained uh, on Western uh, orientation of journalism, which is to hold leadership to account. But this is not the same in China where, um, Journalism is is, is uh, underpinned by celebrating nationhood and by development journalism. I mean, I mean, so they come back to return to Africa with a different perception or a different idea of what journalism should be. Um, this is one of the processes through which uh, influence operation is carried out in the African media space. Because when they, it is easier for for these journalists who have been to China um, to write about China and to to to, to promote pro China message, messaging in the media in Africa. That is one of the processes. Then you have the um, the Belt and Road News Network. Um, is a you know it's a, a kind of a congregation of media organizations, not just uh, not just limited to Africa, uh, but all over the world. But you have African countries about um, about eight, eight, eight media organizations there about from Africa on this platform. Um, and then these organizations, because they are part of the BRN BRNN or BRNA as it may be called. Um, Somehow they are, they are, they are, I would call it something akin to a media capture because, because if you're on that platform, you are not, it's not, it's not, it's not as if, it does not seem as if it's by force, but you are somehow as a form of uh, solidarity, um, they are likely to promote Chinese messaging in the media in Africa. Um, so this happens through that platform. Then you, you also have um, um, what we call um, uh, recently. I, I published a, 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 an article um, in, the, in digital journalism on Chinese digital platform called um, uh, Opera News in, 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 in Lagos, Nigeria, which is owned you know, by the Chinese people. And you, you find out that it's also a different ball game where uh, the messaging is controlled also. You know? um, so these are more, you also have the, I don't know, there, there's this one called content sharing agreements. Um, there's content sharing agreement between the Xinhua news agency with other state-led news agencies in Africa, which is, you know, which you could say is something normal. But then there's also, you know, um, um, content sharing agreement between Xinhua and independent media organizations in Africa. Then there's also, you know, partnership between local Chinese uh, embassies and media organizations, independent media organizations in Africa. So by doing so, you find it difficult to, um, to promote um, uh, stories that are not uh, in tune with uh, with the Chinese government's narrative. So, if, for instance, a media organization has a, a partnership with the uh, with the local Chinese embassy in an African country, you 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 would you would tread you would be tread cautiously um, to report negatively on Chinese or Chinese events. So, these are some platforms, some channels through um, influence operations happening in Africa, and then. Um, in recent times, there have been the 10,000 digital satellite TV projects in Africa. Um, if you if you would recall, most of the influence operations that happen in Africa has happened in the media spaces, and which means that um, the, and this media space is, is inhabited by largely um, elite elite people in Africa. I mean, it's elite people who who have access to media, but there are people in villages who do not have access to uh, media. So, um, the 10,000 digitalized uh, satellite um, TV project, which is in villages in Africa, it makes it easier to reach to, to reach to win um, rural rural dwellers over across African countries. So when taken together, you find out that it's uh, if um, if the audiences are not captured through um, um, uh, through journalists who went to training in China or 
the, the, the media organizations are either captured or local, or local, local populace or local people in African villages are also captured. So in the long run, either ways, China wins. So I, I'll give you an instance. Uh, a particular instance was when um, uh, Nancy Pelosi um, visited uh, Taiwan, which caused a, a kind of geopolitical uh, tension um, all over the world. And then why the world was visited on you know, the global media, um, fra con framing contests on the global media over this incident. Nobody talked about Africa, but in Africa was where the real influence operation was happening. Because when I look through media organizations in, in, in South Africa, uh, Nigeria, and Kenya, I, I could see how media organizations on the, on, on the BRNN and, you know, uh, and the content sharing agreements helped the Chinese people to promote pro-Chinese uh, narrative of that uh, uh, e event in the African media space. So it's easier. I mean, China does not need to struggle much because these alliances, uh, is just, you just have to activate them and they work and they work in favor of the Chinese government. So it's easy for the Chinese uh, um, Communist Party to promote a pro-China messaging in Africa just by activating these diverse um, alliances uh, in the African media space. Uh, thank you for now. Great, thank you. And thank you very much for, for that um, sharp and con concise um, uh, presentation. I want to turn to our two discussants. Uh, first to, to Quibus for a few comments on, on the talk. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Chris and to LSA Ideas for the for the invitation. And also thank you to Freedom House for this for this research. It's it's really crucial. Um, and really fascinating, um, particularly also to see the new methodologies and to see to see the way that that the research has been has been quantified. Um, so you know, just just to, I think you know, kind of in in you know, thinking through this this issue of Chinese media influence in Africa, I think it's it's useful for us to think to to add a few a few kind of contextual kind of undergirdings, you know, kind of to that that will put this kind of research in you know in a slightly broader context. One is that um, direct disinformation and misinformation is is, is a massive problem, um, and um, but it, it feeds into a, another contextual problem, which is relatively low levels of capacity in, among African policymakers and among African African journalists in reporting about very technical issues in the Africa-China relationship. And that then tends to distort debates in a way where even, even countries with high resilience and, very, and, and, and robust cultures of, of freedom of expression end up you know, kind of having their citizens shortcharged. So for example, um, you know, kind of we've, we've seen very in, in relation to Chinese lending um, to Africa, uh, particularly in the case of, of the standard gauge railway contract in Kenya, we've seen very high levels of draconian levels of, of, um, of kind of lack of transparency from the Chinese side, like a complete blocking of the release of, of, of contracts, for example. And that's also been, been echoed from the Kenyan side. So when more, more, um, Discussion about about these contracts came out. One suddenly saw that you know, kind of the that that a low a low level of understanding of the technicalities of these of these agreements ended up distorting the conversation in a way that was that was very un, um, unhelpful. I think for for citizens in Kenya. So the the discussion started like particularly from policymakers, and we saw this in Uganda and Nigeria as well. Tended to focus on this issue of of port seizures. Whereas, you know, kind of which was misunderstanding of, of the details of, of the contract. And in the process, what, you know, more, more pertinent issues like, for example, if these countries, have, you know, the, these countries get forced into arbitration, that that arbitration would be happening in Chinese in China ended up being wiped from the from the conversation you know that that you know kind of misinformation about about particular misinformation caused moral panics about particular issues in the contract and in the process because there's such a low level of capacity among policymakers and journalists about these issues the real problems ended up not being discussed in public at all in the second place um one should also look at the all of these influence building, particularly in relation to the the expansion of of Chinese corporate inter, in, entities like Huawei in Africa, um, and in the these kind of press junkets and, and press training sessions that have, that 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 Emeka also highlighted. 
Well, to keep in mind that a lot of these are, you know, kind of are, are honing in on a, a, a massive demand for training among African journalists, and at the same time, um, a, the, a complete kind of atrophying and, and erosion of, of these, these exchanges from Western partners. You know, so, so in the case of, of Huawei, like Huawei is, 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 is extremely problematic in many ways, but, but the, the reality is that for many African countries, the choice isn't between Chinese internet and, no, and non-Chinese internet. The, the choice is between Chinese internet or no internet. Um, and that is true that those, that same kind of stark choice is frequently true for African journalists too. Like as we've seen that, you know, kind of Western partner countries are cutting down, you know, kind of, continually on, on the number of student visas being issued to, to, African, to African students of all kinds, to the number of visas being issued to African officials, frequently even UN officials from African extraction. You know, as those, as those kind of like entries into those, those kind of opportunities keep narrowing, China offers a, a, a notable alternative, and for for African journalists with with ambition, you know, who want to want to have ex international experience, frequently the Chinese option is the only one going. So you know, so so that that kind of the narrowing of options for for non Chinese alternatives is something I think that's really important to keep in mind. In the third place, I think also you know it's well, what's really really important is is to boost and support reporting um you know by africans about african concerns and to at the same time take into account that those concerns may well differ from traditional western partners you know so for example i you know kind of i, I cover um debt renegotiation a lot um and I've, you know, I, while I'm not an economist, and, and, and you know, and as, as I was reading the popular, the popular media, uh, the Western media about about the problematic aspects of Chinese involvement in African debt, you know, I, I found that it's it's striking how often the role of Western private sector debt is not addressed at all. You know, one could redo a lot of reading of Western of a Western kind of mainstream media and not realize that Western private sector debt is a massive part of African of the African debt load, and that Western private institutions are are actively holding back some of these some of these these processes. You know, at the same time. You know, kind of Western journalists tend to cover Western officials who have their own reasons for highlighting China and de-emphasizing in not picking a fight with Wall Street. So, you know, so that is one example of one can't assume that if were one were to replace Chinese media influence simply with Western media influence, if we could simply CGTN out of the equation and just replace it with the BBC, that doesn't that doesn't solve the problem. Like what, what is needed is African journalists reporting on African priorities from an African perspective, and that needs to be supported. So, you know, kind of, so, so I, I'm gonna start there, but, you know, thank you for this incredibly valuable and really important research. And, and you know, kind of, I think it, it, really, it really will, I think, encourage much more comprehensive debate about the, the issue of foreign influence in Africa. Thank you. Great, thanks, Corbett. Uh, Bing Chun, would you like to present your comments? Yes, um, thanks, Chris, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel. Before I start, though, I just want to put out a very important caveat. I first actually declined when Lucas approached me um, to join this panel because my immediate answer was I haven't really done empirical research in Africa, and I don't think I'm qualified to comment on this. Uh, but then Lucas insisted on in saying that we also want someone to um, who has knowledge and expertise on Chinese media um, in, in general. And actually, when I first declined, the person I recommended as a replacement was Cobus. So Lucas got back to me and saying that, well, actually, Cobus is already on the panel. Um, so I, I, I feel very privileged to be in the same panel with him because I have been following the podcast that him and Eric Olander produced, China um, in Africa podcast. It's, it's an excellent source of information for me. So um, I think since I haven't really done research about Chinese media in Africa, and so it's only fitting maybe for me to speak um, last and then to uh, maybe step back a little bit and comment on the, the, the report and, and how some of the, I, I think how some of the um, 
conceptual and method methodological issues arising from the report and the study itself could maybe um, help us further um, refining the research agenda about um, Chinese media's presence, not just in Africa, but also um, globally. Um, so when I was when I was reading the the report in preparation um, for this, I I thought it's interesting that even though this is a you know report based on um, fresh new findings, but uh, it also reads a bit familiar. Um, it's almost like there is an this archetypical casting of uh, Cold War 2.0, um, only with China replacing Soviet Union as, as the um, arch enemy of the free world. And then if you look at those countries that scored better in terms of the resilience against Chinese influence. Um, so the US and its close allies are the leaders of the free world and African countries are vulnerable and can easily fall into the prey of, of China. Um, and, and I think, you know, in, in the podcast that uh, Cobus um, took part, uh, take part in, in producing, I, I remember already there's a lot of um, criticism of this kind of uh, sort of projection about Africa's position in the Geo, in this geopolitical environment, um, as if African countries don't have the agency, as if they are, and, and also I think to a certain extent, they are being infantilized, being projected as this kind of easy prey to um, a new rising power, which is also authoritarian, so which is, makes it um, even worse. Um, and I think in a way, this kind of, um, archetypical casting of, of Cold War 2.0 um, is, is probably embedded in some of the um, conceptual assumptions, uh, premises, and also the methodological approach of the study. So I just wanted to offer two comments on the conceptualization and then two comments maybe on the methodology. So first of all, I think um, here, um, the concept of freedom. Um, freedom here is conceptualized in abstract and absolute terms. While I'm inclined to th think of freedom in contextual and relative terms. Um, one person's of freedom of speech is an, could be another person's hate speech and blasphemy. And I think in a way, the last comment that Cobus made in a way, um, illustrated this point in the sense that it's not necessarily that the U.S. and its allies are in possession or, ca or capable of having, um, you know, the the to 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 manifest freedom of speech in the the best way. And any narratives that counter that um, is considered as some kind of propaganda. But I think it's very important, as Cobus was um, just highlighting, um, there is often the, the truth is contested depending on your positionality, depending on from which um, perspective you are speaking from. So this is why I think to replace Chinese media influence with BBC is not necessarily the solution. It's more important to promote the African or the local perspective um, because they will have different um, interests. They will have a different way of looking at many issues. So I think it's important to keep in mind when we talk about freedom, it's not a dichotomy and there's no way we can think of freedom in abstract and absolute terms. Um, and this is related to the notion of truth, of course, uh, which I'm gonna touch upon when I talk about the methodological aspect. Um, so in that sense, I think media freedom then is also very much embedded in the local and also in the, uh, in the material um, conditions. Um, I think again, sort of um, following on from Kobe's comment about how um, often African the kind of choice that African countries face is not Chinese internet or no, no Chinese internet, but really the, the material conditions really constrain the kind of communication and speech environment one can have. 
Um, so the second, my second comment about the the on the conceptual aspect is how we think about Beijing's media influence. I think the the sort of the the premise of this study seemed to uh, conceptualize Beijing's media influence as aggression and also ultimately this aggression could lead to some kind of conversion um, to convert um, the, the political system in, in African countries. But actually, I would like to suggest another way of thinking about Beijing's media influence, which is more reactive and also often it's pragmatic rather than having an overall ideological agenda. It's more about reacting to what China perceives as the um, unfair media coverage, um, especially by uh, international media in, 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 the, in the liberal world. So in terms of methodology, of course, as social scientists, we all know that the, your methodology is closely linked with your conceptualization because it's an attempt trying to operationalize uh, your conceptualization. Um, I, I can see that, um, and, and I think Angela also mentioned in passing in her presentation and in the, in the report um, itself, um, there is this premise of the study that's based on the, um, the understanding that um, Western media reports of key events like the initial outbreak of COVID-19 in Wuhan, like what happened in Hong Kong in 2019, like the whole zero COVID policy. Those are the undisputable truth and the whole truth. So any narratives from Chinese media that counter the hegemonic narratives in the West are deemed as propaganda. And that's that's how you know this so this this that's how the studies is operationalized. How, how the operationalization of the studies based on. Um, but I think again that's that's linked to my um, earlier comment about how we understand um, freedom and uh, media freedom. I I think that premise is extremely problematic. Um, and secondly, in in terms of again you know so the, I'm now. Again, speaking more as a as a media scholar rather than an expert about Chinese media's influence in, in Africa, is that in general, when we think about influence, when, when we say we're gonna study media influence, can we do that without looking at the daily media practice of audience, of people? Or can we really assume that people are only vulnerable to any propaganda. So can we assume this kind of magic bullet model that as if if the message is out there, if if the message is there, it's gonna have an impact. And I think in a way, the public opinion poll reported and, and, and mentioned, and I think also one of the, 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 the key findings about how there's often a discrepancy between the effort or the attempt and the actual sort of the the outcome. Um, and I think this discrepancy also says a lot about how should we, when we think about media influence, maybe we should go beyond, um, you know, doing desk research and talking to uh, journalists and, and government officials and, and, and civil society and actually look more closely at the daily media practice of uh, people on the, on the ground. And, and similarly, I, I think, you know, in terms of the resilience of democratic system, can we study the resilience of a democratic system without looking into the complex power dynamics um, on, the, on the ground? The, the US may think it needs to act as some kind of democratic missionary to impose democracy from the outside. Although as we learn from history that US probably has done more in destroying nascent democracy than uh, supporting it in South America, in Middle East. But I don't think China think of itself as an authoritarian mission, missionary that wants to remodel Africa um, in, in its own um, image. So, so, so I, I, I think that kind of methodological, the, the, the operationalization of resilience of uh, a democratic system and also the operationalization of um, media influence, um, probably you know, we, 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 we could also go beyond what the current um, study is, is, is trying to do. So um, I think I'm gonna stop there. Great, thank you very much.
uh, for, for those comments. And um, what I'd like to do is, is there are a number of questions that have come in and uh, I have a question myself and, and speakers may want to, to engage in a debate with some of the discussion we've just had. So um, I uh, let me start by asking the speakers to, if you could hone in on what it is that's distinctive about Chinese approaches in, in media influencing that the, from say, Western ones. What 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 is in the examples that were provided? Often, both of the two speakers talked about uh, referenced Western efforts that were similar. So I'm I'm trying to get to the the particulars of what it is that China does that is distinctive, or is the distinctiveness the China ness of it, if you like, or the party single party ness. But if you could get uh, if you could answer that or, or give us some sense of that. And then, of course, um, we, we can turn to some of the other questions or, or comments you would like to make as well. Okay. Um, can, I, can, I, oh, can I just um, go ahead. Can I just come in here? Um, yeah, so I just, in terms of uh, media training in China, um, I would just want to um, quote uh, one of the professors that train um, journalists in, uh, at the Chinese uh, University of Communication. Um, and this is what he said. His name is Professor uh, Zhang Wenhu of CUC. And he said, I avoid use, using Western concepts like liberal or conservative because they are loaded with implications and stereotypes that may not reflect China's true conditions. So what the implication of this is that when journalists are exposed um, to this concept that are Chinese, they're not African. I mean, if we want the, these trainings in China uh, to also reflect the African reality, I mean, they should go there, maybe teach the journalists about Ubuntu or about, uh, you know, some other African concepts, you know, but that is not what is being done. So, but when they go to China, they are taught Chinese concepts. So they live with the idea of, you know, Chinese concept and come back to Africa to face African realities. So um, even though we could argue that uh, maybe China is trying to train them in journalism or whatever, but we're saying if the if the Chinese people had gone there and said, okay, oh, you are from Africa, and you are your ideology is based on your live reality, is based on Ubuntu, is based on such another African, you know, real theoretical concepts. Oh, that is what we're going to teach you. But that is not happening. They are teaching them Chinese idea of journalism. So they leave China and return back to Africa with the Chinese way of doing journalism. And this kind of you know um counteracts with, with what they actually knew before. So whether we agree or not, this tells you that um, it is not just um, you know, an ordinary training like that for um, African journalists. They, they, they also live with ideologies that affect their own um, journalism practices when they come back to Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Anjali, if you, you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I haven't done any kind of comprehensive study on Western media, but some of the kind of examples that came up in um, in our research, like for instance in Senegal, some of the content um, uh, not content sharing agreements, um, they uh, China Radio International um, built a studio and hired a lot of African journalists, which is a positive. It's giving um, opportunities for journalists to work and uh, to train in sometimes high tech studios. But in some instances, the editorial decisions are still made in Beijing. And I think that's kind of one of the distinctions that creating these opportunities, but still controlling some of the content and um, editorial decisions in Beijing to, that can be influenced by the party. And I think that is um, just one of the distinctions that makes it different. Great. Um, I don't know if our other speakers wanted to had anything. Yes, uh, Bing Chun. Um, yeah, just just quick um, comments. But um, again, just want to say that my comments is not are not really based on empirical research in Af Africa, but my more based on my understanding of the different political system and also the different kind of relationships that the these two um, you know different political systems have with media organizations. So if you ask me, you know, what are the, the, the differences between the Western media's influence and Chinese media's influence in, in Africa? Um, 
I think probably two things. One is that um, I think the Western media's influence is operating um, under the, you know, the already established hegemony, um, the, the hege hegemonic um, status of liberal democratic value. So there is a lot of self-righteousness um, underpinning that. But what I tend to think that drives Chinese media's influence or Chinese, China's effort to expand its media influence in Africa is underpinned more by an indignation rather than a self-righteousness. And this is linked to what I said earlier about how it's a reactive effort. So it's indignation because China perceives itself being wronged by the hegemonic discourse. So it's trying to um, launch some kind of uh, counter-hegemonic narrative. And secondly, maybe also this, I think, has to do with the authority nature of the political system. That is, often there's a very strong element of actually speaking to the domestic audience or to the domestic constituency through its presence in Africa. And I think maybe that's something that I, I don't see at least not as explicitly in Western media's influence in, in Africa. And similarly with the, the whole Ukrainian war. And, and so I, I think Seneca podcast also had some discussion about this. Often, you know, the, the, the diplomatic gesture and also the decisions overseas, um, implicitly there is the assumption that actually it's addressing the, the, the domestic constituency. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Corpus. You're on mute. Uh, I am, um, so, so just very briefly, uh, just picking up from Bing Jun's point, um, I completely agree that, and that, that I think, I think that that also relates to Anjali's point of this kind of, that Emeka's research has also raised this issue of, the, of, of like central editorial control remaining in Beijing. The, the, one of the effects of that is not only as, as Bing Chun mentioned that, that a lot of the coverage ends up speaking back to the domestic audience in China, but it also then frequently reflects uh, pressure within, you know, kind of pressure from, you know, within different levels of editors and the way that those, that those editors within state media then connect to state institutions and party institutions that actually end up making Chinese media communicate less effectively with, with African audiences, you know, um, in the sense that there's a lot of pressure to, for example, maintain uh, a uniformity of, of vocabulary, you know, kind of so, so, you know, kind of to work in party phrases like, you know, kind of the, the uh, a community of shared destiny, for example, you know, kind of those, those kind of like, that kind of like a CCP you know, kind of kinds of ways of speaking tend to seep in because of these kind of interpersonal relationships between editors, you know, kind of out, Chinese editors out in Africa, Chinese editors in Beijing, Chinese editors in Beijing and people be above them in, you know, kind of in state institutions. And in, in contrast to that, I think, the kind of Western media tends to be very consumer focused, you know, kind of as, as part as part of their, you know, kind of as part of their kind of wider, the, some of the wider kind of ideological kind of con context within that, that Bing Chun was, was highlighting. And then, you know, kind of with, with that then comes Western media having, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a much higher level of of kind of overlap between between media for domestic consumption and media for international consumption. Frequently, there's very little distinction between, say, American media being being this, you know kind of consumed, particularly in entertainment context and mass media context within the country and outside. You know, so with that then comes this a kind of a. A, a kind of a flattening, you know, kind of where there's, there's this kind of like little space again for, for local specificity from, you know, kind of from, from audiences and, and that, that's, that kind of lack is then made of the kind of uniculture kind of aspect is then made up uh, or recuperated by, by, um, inter, by individual consumption choices made by, by kind of people in a kind of a globalized media space. Um, you know, kind of where where there's all of these different kind of market options, 
and frequently where China, where those market options are, are similarly kind of offered by Chinese entities as well. So Star Times does, for example, offer you know a significant number of, of Chinese state channels, but they also offer a lot of African content, a lot of Western content, and so on as well. It's kind of a mixed bag, and you know kind of and then again like uh, you know with that then I, I completely agree with Bing Chun's point that that I think there's really a, a need for audience research you know in an African context. Great, thanks. Um, I've got three. Emeka, is you, was your hand left over from the previous one, right? Yeah, okay. I've got three questions here. So let me um, uh, pose them in the first two and then get to the third. First one is, uh, what exactly, from Yasmin, what exactly does public opinion measure and what is the difference to status? So that's one question. The second one um, from Gerilyn, is the media influence in certain African countries more positive than negative? And, and what, perhaps this is more, the most important point of it is, what does this influence exactly mean for, for China? So well, what does it produce in the end? So perhaps I could ask uh, um, uh, Angela to, to start and then Emeka to follow. Yeah, so one of the reasons that we looked at public opinion was an attempt to measure impact and um, in some ways, I mean, to Bing Chun's earlier point of people's day-to-day -day habits um, in a study like this, invariably we can't really go into the kind of level of depth that we would have liked to really measure you know, what this means. So, you know, we relied on those kinds of public opinion surveys to get measure some kind of sense um, that you know, maybe it's not specific to media influence, but is an influence in these countries over a period of time and to measure them going up and down. And, you know, not an African country, but I thought an interesting um, result from kind of the research was Panama, which had very high levels of favorability towards China prior to the switch in diplomatic relations. And you know, the change of public opinion that turned negative could be just in part due to increased attention. Um, but it's, it is a kind of crude measure to attempt to um, measure that. Um, and in terms of the statuses as based on our methodology, um, and it was, you know, it's an attempt to kind of take um, what we learned and try and you know, give a status to it um, through the scores that we gave um, for the footprint and the um, resilience of response. So Mecca, sorry. Yeah, um, I, I will just, I will just uh, speak to the second question in terms of uh, negative and positive influence. Um, I think it, it, differs in, it differs from country to countries and um, you know, um, the more the, the, the influence in a particular country means that it's easier uh, for Chinese uh, messaging, um, you know, um, to to be promoted in that media in that media space in that particular country. Um, so yeah, this, I think, this also have to do with issue of you know resilience in particular countries. You know, in some countries you have more um, effective uh, civil society organization, more. Um, uh, effective, uh, you know, political actors who are familiar. I mean, most, one of the biggest issues is um, uh, awareness. People in Af most people in Africa are not even aware of this, what is happening on the ground. So, um, so in certain countries, you have, you know, the awareness is higher, and people know what is happening. So the, the resilience is higher. But uh, in some other African countries, you don't have any of that. So um, there, uh, the influence is small. Um, it's, it's it's more it's it's, it's higher. And then, you know, um, um, Chinese messaging um, find it easier uh, to to penetrate in the in that media ecosystem than in in the other uh, media ecosystem in Africa. I think this is what I just uh, want to add to it. Thank you. Well, I, unfortunately, we do have other questions here, but I I think and as uh, you've touched on some of the points that were related that that were brought in by these, and we're also hitting the hour, <laughs> so I'm afraid that we have to. Uh, uh, draw this to a close. Um, first, to thank the speakers who, who provided and given of their time uh, uh, to this topic, uh, an important one. Um, I feel that we've, you know, in the short time we've we've had been together, we've been able to unpack many different uh, dimensions there. I, I urge uh, you to read the report and reflect on on our comments as well here. Um,
and uh, to thank uh, all of you, the audience, for participation. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you at our next events. Uh, we've had a couple of events uh, looking at the role of Chinese provinces on, on China foresight um, uh, as actors. And, uh, and uh, so keep, keep uh, linking into our uh, LSE Ideas website for additional uh, events coming up. Thank you again to the speakers. Thanks to the audience and to the organizers, uh, my colleagues here at LSE Ideas. See you then. Cheers. Bye.